Thank you so very much. Good morning. Good morning. How are we feeling today? Good. Are we feeling good? Yes. All right. I am honored to be here. I don't know if our great mayor, uh, Robert Garcia, is still here. Um, I don't know if he had just left. I just want to uh, recognize uh, the great mayor of Long Beach for welcoming each and every one of you uh, to uh, this amazing conference. He has done an incredible job, and I just want to uh, recognize uh, uh, our mayor, uh, one of the greatest cities uh, in California, not the country, uh, Mayor uh, Robert Garcia. So let's get it for Robert Garcia one more time. <laughs> now I want to say good morning uh, to each and every one of you, to the incredible organizers, the activists, the advocates, the community members, uh, the retailers, the distributors, the manufacturers, the cultivators, to each and every one of you for bringing this together at this very, very amazing event. Now, if you were to ask me, perhaps 10 years ago, uh, that I'd be keynoting uh, an address at the cannabis, uh, at a cannabis conference on a haunted ship, um, <laughs> I would have asked you to give me some of what you were smoking. You know? uh, and if I thought that our former Attorney General of the great state of California would be here also too, Mr. Bill Lockyer in the house right over here. Let's get up for the Attorney General, Bill Lockyer. A great businessman himself also too, uh, who understands the, the, the incredible benefits uh, of the cannabis industry for the great city of California in the nation. But let me say this, we are at a very critical time, a very critical moment in our nation's history, where our essential human and constitutional rights are at stake. And it's time that we double down on what we believe, that the cannabis industry in California carries the bright green promise of good high wage paying jobs, a boost to our state budget, and growth for our local labor organizations. Right now, as we all know, as we've known for a very long time, the federal law puts cannabis on the list of nar narcotics right next to heroin as well as cocaine on schedule one, which to me, and so I know everybody on this ship right now and everyone across the state of California thinks is utterly ridiculous and absurd. Considering how many states today have actually legalized cannabis, either for medicinal or recreational use. And that total today is 29 states across the country. As a result, cannabis accounts for more than half of drug arrests in the United States. Now, I just want you to let that sink in just for a moment, because in 2016 alone, in 2016 alone, there were more than 600,000 people charged with cannabis violations. Now, growing up in Logan Heights, for those who are from San Diego or who live in San Diego, uh, I watched the impacts of the United States' failed war on drugs unfold before my very own eyes families torn apart, and a promising futures that were cut short, as law enforcement disproportionately arrested poor people and poor people of color for cannabis crimes. My neighbors, my friends, even some of my family members. Our nation's Kafka-esque federal laws against this plant were the beginning of an extremely toxic relationship between communities like mine and law enforcement. It is time that we put an end to this unjust practice by electing real leaders at the federal level who are focused on descheduling cannabis as we know it today. And if you want, and if we do want a government that will truly improve the human condition for all individuals, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they come from, regardless of the hue of their skin, regardless of which God they pray to or who they love, or yes, even their legal status. If you want a federal government that truly improves the human condition for all individuals, the rest of the nation, as well as our senior senator from California, should join California in pushing for racial justice and demanding reforms to our, broke, our country's broken cannabis laws system as we know it today. Now, we had uh, a senator who was going to be here today, um, and we had a conversation earlier this morning, Senator Steve Bradford. Uh, I affectionately call him Stevie B. 
and he has a measure that is sitting on the governor's desk, which is Senate Bill 1294, which deals with the issues of equity with regards to making sure those individuals who were caught up by the unjust laws and by the scheduling, scheduling one of cannabis, have a real opportunity to be entrepreneurs themselves, and have a real opportunity to be successful in the cannabis industry. Because for those who may not know, I've always been a strong supporter of green energy, and that energy be, being clean, renewable energy. In California today, a governor signed my law which puts us on a 100% pathway to clean energy by the year 2045. We're the largest economy on planet Earth that has legally mandated 100% clean energy for the great state of California. We are moving the state, the fifth largest economy in the world, towards a green energy space where we'll have high wage jobs, renewable clean energy. Well, it's not just about green energy in the clean energy space but it's about green energy to in a new renewable space, which is cannabis, as, I know it to, as we know it today. The twin pillars of an economy, of the fifth largest economy in the world today. And think about this. We are the largest subnational in the world to legalize cannabis, both medicinal as well as recreational use. And we're the largest economy in the world to commit to decarbonize the grid by 100% legally. These are gonna be the twin pillars, if you will, of our economy. And we need to make sure that we're inclusive, but we also need to make sure that Washington, D.C. gets its act together. In California, we de demonstrate to the rest of the world that cannabis can be legalized in a just, safe, and profitable way. Now, I know we have a lot more work to do, starting with working together to stabilize and strengthen this growing industry, even in a state like California, where the rest of the country receives 70% of our exports. For starters, we need to make sure that existing small cannabis businesses are able to grow and flourish in their own right, <laughs> to avoid a hostile takeover of this industry by extremely very powerful corporations. We must focus on building solid banking infrastructure so business owners aren't forced to risk their lives every single day carrying thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash just to pay their taxes. That's like a Kafka novel, once again. We, are, we have legalized constitutionally through Prop 64 the recreational use of cannabis. But at the same time, many of your lives are put at risk every single day because the federal laws, and we don't allow for the banking to actually occur. Now, I'll be your champion and your voice in Washington, in the U.S. Senate, to put cannabis on track for, fe for federal legalization so we can stabilize this industry and put people to work, and I will be your advocate here today. Have no doubt about that. So, as long as it is incorrectly classified, as a Schedule One drug, the industry here in California won't be able to stabilize or grow. For more than 20 years, our cannabis industry has been forced to operate, as we know, in the shadows. Prop 215, the Compassionate Caregiver Act of 1996, hoped to change that by legalizing the, medic the medicinal use of cannabis in California. But the lack of local cooperation made this, in fact, to some degree, a toothless law. Even with the passage of Prop 64, the federal government is still threatening businesses who comply with state law only to get caught in the vice, the vice grip of federal cannabis law enforcement. We have a Department of Justice headed up by Jeff Sessions, who has made it very clear that he will do everything within his power to shut down the cannabis industry. Now, there is a confluence of intersectionality on the issue that we care deeply about, the right to breathe clean air into our lungs, the right to drink clean water, the right for our families who have been here 10, 15, 20, 25 years to be legalized in the greatest country in the world and to not live in fear, live in the shadows, not knowing if at four in the morning there'll be a hard knock at the door with ICE agents, 
or young children feeling the fear of anxiety, young children not knowing if their mothers or fathers are going to pick them up after school. I was in Oxnard yesterday at an elementary school, fifth graders, fifth graders. And these young boys and girls at this school uh, were incredibly precocious, so intelligent, so smart, with huge dreams and aspirations. Their parents, many of them, actually picked strawberries in Oxnard and Ventura County, citrus and pyru, sunkiss, lemons, oranges, limes, and they all talked about Donald Trump. And I want to be respectful for any folks here who may be supportive of Donald Trump. But I don't think there are any. <laughs> At least any will come out of the closet you know, today. But that being said, these fifth, these fifth graders were so intuitive to what was happening in the country today. And I can say this, Republican or Democrat, that I drive a lot of my, although I'm a former assembly member, state senator today, uh, just recently until just a few months ago, uh, the leader of the California State Senate, your state senate, um, uh, along with my good friend and colleague, um, the former pro tem himself, Bill Lockyer, it's a very small, very illustrious club of only a handful of individuals who ever have held that title. Um, I'm not as political as people think I am in terms of sitting with political consultants and sitting with pollsters and have you, et cetera. I watch and I watch constituents and the people I care deeply about. And on November 9th, 2016, the day after the election, when you saw young kids as young as kindergarten age crying, crying, because who was elected as president? I don't recall any children of any Republican crying when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. In fact, I don't even recall any children of any Democrat, no matter how left, how liberal that Democrat activist may be, crying when George W. Bush was elected to the presidency of the United States. But to have children crying, not from joy, but actually from deep fear of who was about to possess the most powerful office in the world and what it meant for them and their families, when you have young children crying, that's what drives me in my decision making right there. So when you have a Department of Justice that seeks to make sure that cannabis stays schedule one and seeks to divide our families and to make sure that this industry does not grow, and is not successful, and we're not gonna do banking, we're gonna make sure you stay in the most vulnerable position possible in terms of just cash only. This is why we need the right leadership. The right leadership, like with my good friend, Reggie Jones Soy, right here will be one of your keynote speakers, has been a great champion for all of you in our state capitol. Folks like Rob Bonta, who will be here later on today from Oaktown, from Oakland. Stevie Bradford, who couldn't be here today, as well as Ricardo Lara, who couldn't be here today as well too. Folks like R Roberto, uh, Robert, Robert Garcia. That's why elections are consequential. They matter. They make a difference. Let me finish up here. In the first quarter of this year alone, Cannabis brought into our California state budget $60.9 million. My staff should have just rounded off and said 70, you know. $60.9 million. And we expect the excise tax to bring in more than half a billion dollars by the end of this year. We can invest these critical dollars in improving our education system, expanding law enforcement resources, and building an economy that works for all of us, not just for some but for all of us. What we're building here in California could become a model for the rest of the nation. We're cutting a path forward for other states and our federal government to follow. It's time for real leadership. And we'll bring this industry out of the shadows so we can get to work achieving the economic growth this industry promises. Because we know that the status quo is not working. The same old, same old is not working. The status quo, in fact, is too dangerous. It's not sustainable. And it's a result of weak leadership in Washington, D.C. Let me say this finally. This is why, because passing 215, medicinal use of cannabis, and passing Prop 64, recreational use of cannabis, and everything else that we need to do in California, this is why we must remain America's exceptional example. 
a beacon of hope and opportunity in a very uncertain world that we're not going to allow as Californians one electoral aberration reverse generations of progress at the height of our historic diversity, our scientific advancement, our economic output, and our sense of global responsibility. That's our role, to advocate, to agitate, to organize, to make sure that we are respected and that we're legitimized, that we are a true pillar of the economy of California, so folks can come out of the shadows and they can grow their businesses and be successful. And we have an inclusive, diverse economy that benefits everybody, not just somebody, not just those at the highest economic strata, but actually improving the condition for all individuals, regardless of who they are and where they come from. To each and every one of you, I want, wish you the very best today in a very successful, successful conference as you engage in so many critical issues that are important to the vitality of this industry, not just for California, but for the rest of the nation. Because as California goes, as you know, the rest of the nation will follow, especially Washington. With that, God bless each and every one of you, and have a wonderful conference. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.